Welcome to the lecture series of Public Theology, a cooperation of the Berlin Institute for Public Theology, the Bayer's Now Day Center for Public Theology, and the Lutheran World Federation. Well, colleagues, uh, good day to you. It's uh, a joy to be here with Professor Pit Nodia. Um, Professor Nodia is Professor of Ethics at the University of Stellenbosch Business School. He's the immediate past director of the business school and uh, was also an extraordinary professor in systematic theology and ethics at the University of Stellenbosch. And today he's speaking to us all the way from Munich. Uh, Professor Nodia, welcome and thanks, thanks for being with us this afternoon. Hi, Dion. Thank you so much. It's such an honor and privilege for me to be part of this project. Uh, I really give honor to God. You know, I rem was reminded again over the weekend that we must love God with all our mind. And I really want to do that. So thanks for this opportunity. Thanks, Prof. And, and we're so grateful. Looking forward to the conversation in the next uh, half hour or so, where we're going to talk very specifically about public theology and issues of economic concern. And just to, to mention to uh, those who are watching, you wrote a very excellent chapter on that um, in the African Public Theology book. And we'll, we'll tell those who are watching uh, a few more resources a little bit later on. But Prof, I wonder if you can maybe just introduce yourself to us and give us a little bit of, of background about who you are um, and your own connections to, to theology and economics and issues of, of public theological concern. Yeah, uh, Dion, I started off my, my studies in philosophy uh, and did a, a master's degree that had a great impact on me on, on the issue of distributive social justice. To put it in simple language, how should we order society to create a just society? And I mainly followed Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, uh, the contract theory in John Rawls. Then I did my PhD in systematic theology on the relationship, if you can call it, between dogma, doctrine, and, and life, to put it simple. They, they are now high academic terms for that, but that was basically what it was. And that really formed my sort of academic frame. And then in my own life, I was a pastor in, in, in ministry uh, from micro issues like marriage problems right through to talking to the town council about creating jobs. Later went uh, stronger into the applied ethics fields in the universities, extending to the accounting profession, uh, the public uh, service profession. And that took me into the business school environment where I had a, get a wider exposure to the actual practice in business. So I did a bit of consulting and talking to companies about how can we bring about better justice in society, how could we govern ourselves better. So it's been a lifelong commitment, starting off with some very theoretical stuff, which is important, uh, but leading right through to where I ended up my last part of my career formally in the business school itself, where we teach students going out into the business world, what are the things we should look at? And the major concern is justice. We need to find a more just dispensation. Mm, mm. You know, Prof, as you're speaking, I'm, I'm thinking of the words of someone like Andrew Newbigin, who said, you know, the, the sort of era of, of the power of the nation state has been surpassed by that of multinational corpora corporations. And if I think about some of the really big issues that people face individually, that we face uh, as, as nations, as yeah. continents on the planet, they all seem to come back to, to economics. Tell us a little bit about this particular issue. Why do you think economics matters yeah. in public theology? Yeah, Dion, obviously the, the theology side of public theology has been addressed well uh, for me in very simple terms. Public theology is a theology that addresses matters of public concern Mm. in a public way, that it, it is accessible, it is rational, people can understand it. And, um, you know, I, I, I looked at, at societal shifts over the last, say, 30 to 40 years, and it's very, very clear that if one look at modern societies and even some late modern and postmodern societies, we've got different social spheres. You've got the sphere of of politics, you've got the sphere of culture, you've got the sphere of religion, uh, you've got the sphere of, of sport and leisure, you've got the sphere of economics. And, uh, you know, we are taught by very good people like Niklas Luhmann, uh, a very famous uh, a German sociologist, he says, if those spheres 
interact with one another, respecting their boundaries and respecting the rationalities of each, you get what one could call a, a well-ordered society. Mm. But what sometimes happens is the rationality and way of thinking of one sphere started to invade other spheres. And what has happened, and, and your point is so correct, what has happened is that the market type of thinking, the economic logic, became the logic not only of economics and the markets where it works very well, but it went into the family, it went into higher education, it actually definitely went into religion, becoming mass religion, big money stuff. And, and that is a, a sad uh, occurrence because what then happens is you, you invert the logic. Efficiency is a fantastic value for business, but it's a bad value for family. Mm. <laughs> and uh, what I've witnessed over time is if public theology wants to address matters of public concern, it simply has to look at this straight ahead because economics or the economic way of thinking has become the way of thinking. It has become the norm. And we need to really address that quite, quite directly. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I tend to share your concern. I mean, so much of what we see happening in, in churches and communities um, is driven by either economic interests overtly or, or subtly. Now, I wonder if, if you could give us some insight into some theological sources. Um, yeah. what, what is available that we can use to, to chart this relationship between economics and, yeah. and our theological convictions? Yeah. Let me just say, uh, all of us who are involved in some form of public theology has to understand, you first have to understand the theological language well. Hmm. You must make sure that you are well-rooted in theology. I'll say a bit more about that now. Then you have to look at the social sphere or public issue that you wish to address, whether it's work or corruption or democracy or whatever, and understand the language of that sphere. And then hmm. the, the, the skill of a, of a public theologian or an applied ethicist is that you have to be bilingual. You need to learn both languages well, and then in a kind of third way, bring those languages uh, together. So let me stick to this side. Um, for me, we, Dion, we really underestimate the power of scripture. Scripture remains the source for all theologies. I'm a reformed theologian, so for me that is sort of a methodological uh, starting point. But I mean, mm. I've spoken to many other people, charismatic people, Pentecostal people, Eastern Orthodox people, Catholic people. We've got different emphases, but scripture in my, and let me just warn right from the start, we must be very careful not to take one portion of scripture and make as if that is the total message of scripture around mm. business or economics. And we've been warned, and I, you know, I love Martin Luther, what a, what a hero of faith. But his, his, his very strong emphasis on the God-mammon division has brought into many theologians' mind this idea that the market is always bad, business is for, you know, scrupulous people, whereas scripture is extremely rich. And let me not dwell on that now. That is the main source. And then beyond scripture, obviously, uh, we find the, the, the uh, confessions of the church, starting with Nicaea 381, uh, the Reformation ones around the 16th century, specifically the Heidelberger Catechism, beautiful when it discusses the Ten Commandments. Ah, Dion, it, it is commentary on business is so important. And then obviously we look later at the, at the, the Barman Declaration and then the very specific uh, later confessions has to do almost directly with economic issues. Uh, and that is obviously the, 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 the Bellar Confession 1986 mm. and the Accra, which was very strong. So th that is an important one. Then a third um, source is a theological thinking through the ages. Um, all great theologians gave time to God's economy uh, in sense of saving grace, but also the economics of society. And then what is a very rich source is our ecumenical movement. There's been beautiful publications from the World Council of Churches and from the Catholic Church specifically and the social doctrine of the church. So there's not a, a shortage of very good sources to build a theological framework. Yeah, yeah. Prof, I, I <clears throat> always remember once uh, you, you gave a, a lecture for us at the winter school at, at one of our, our conferences and you, you made a statement. You said, often when you hear theologians speaking about economic issues, they sound very passionate, 
but uh, they lack some of the skills to be able to to translate between theology yeah. and, and economics. And I think that that is a reality. But but in part, I think you know what I'm hearing you say now also is we have to be good theologians. You know, um, yeah. it was uh, Miroslav Volf who said. You know, if we were to look at all of the pages throughout history that have been devoted to something like transubstantiation, which does or does not happen on a Sunday, <laughs> and compare that to what most of our members are doing with most of their waking lives, we'll find yeah. that the number of pages devoted to work pales in comparison yeah. to some yeah. of those other area no, doubt issues. You know, Dion, that, that paradox, on the one <laughs> hand, we are, I mean, I am... Um, I wrote a very technical article on the on the on the uh, on the Nicene Creed, the difference between the 325 and the 381 version. I mean, um, I asked my good friend Dirk Ismond, how many people you think will read this? He says, Pete, I think three. So I said, <laughs> who are them? He said, well, firstly, you yourself. <laughs> then you've asked me and perhaps the editor of the journal. <laughs> we, Dion, and I'm not, I'm not, and, and you know me well enough, I, I am will never degenerate or put down hard academic work. But you know what? Uh, a public theology really pushes us to say, okay, if you want to engage in deep dogmatics, it's fine. But mm. then you have to take the second step. What does that then mean? And you mm. know, I later wrote the importance of the Nicene Creed for gendered relations. I mean, it was marvelous what comes out of that mm. uh, so i would say do not do not stop doing hard dogmatic or, 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 or conceptual work but please guys we live in serious times uh it's a kairos moment for us to speak and as public theologians we have to also learn the language in, in my case today uh, of economics and that's why i spend a lot of time with business people also christian business people who say pete it's easier for you guys to make big pronouncements out there but if you run mm. a company under COVID and we have to take a decision on retrenchments what will guide me it's mm. tough so Point yeah, and I think that that's the important point. And, and uh, Prof, maybe if you can give us some insights into, into a kind of theological framework uh, that yeah. might aid us in the relationship between public theology and economics. You know, uh, one can make many choices here. And, and what I'm doing now is sort of just almost brainstorming to say, you know, there are different possibilities. One could, for instance, take the classical Trinitarian approach and just say, if God is our creator and we confess that, it has at least two implications for economics. Firstly, is that creation is sacred. It belongs to the Lord. And if we are appointed as stewards of that, we need to do it carefully. So the whole green movement, green business, blah, 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 it's all in that confession of God as a great. It also immediately speaks to uh, the human person made in the image of God and, and, you know, the whole human rights culture that in a way can be linked to that and what that means for business. And I mean, these days, the debates about business and human rights, doing business in China or in other mm. people becoming really, really very, very hot. It's an important topic. Then you can go to Jesus Christ, uh, the one who, who, who redeemed us. And there it's important, the self-donation, the incarnation impetus of Christ. What does that mean for uh, an economics of, of, of compassion? Of, or mm. is compassion not a value that belongs in business at all? And by the way, I've done some really, really good work with companies who say, we need compassion. We can't mm. simply run this place like, you know, people are machines. We need a way of understanding where they are. And then obviously the third person of the Trinity, uh, beautiful, the spirit who sanctifies us, uh, where, where everything we do, we don't do it for the people, but as if for the Lord, uh, you know, from, from, from Scripture in New Testament. So I think one can use Trinity as a, as a very, very fruitful basis to think into, into the economic sphere. One can also use ecclesiology, if you want, and say, okay, let's talk about the church. The church is a prophetic community. We speak up against the injustice, but we're also a, a priestly community. We're there to serve. And we're also a royal community. You know, mm. we are kings. We, 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 not only, we are not only kings over sin, but also over injustice. So there are many fruitful ways for us to retain our theological integrity whilst we address uh, issues of economic concern. Yeah, and, and you I know, think the Revelation theology obviously has taken the theme of God the liberator and really translated that powerfully into different forms of economic justice. So there are many options. You can either take a, a dogmatic structure or you can take a scriptural theme and work that out. So much to do, uh, all of them, I think, valid and beautiful. 
Absolutely. And I think that's, the, you know, that point really does strike me. Um, you know, Prof, as you know, I worked for some years alongside a, a Christian businessman and often found him struggling. You know, he's very sincere in his faith. Um, mm. Unlike me, he was never called to the ordained ministry. And, and he had to ask himself, if, if I'm not called to be a pastor, then yeah. maybe I'm called to do business and to do business in a way that can, can honor God, that can safeguard creation, that can witness to God's goodness in society, that can, can be constructive, making the world yeah. a better place. And, wow. and who is there to guide me other, than, other yeah. than persons who are thinking theologically about the will of God? So, so that really is helpful. Now, one of the things that I think that's particularly disturbing, and we see this particularly in the context that you and I come from in, in, mm. in Africa, uh, also in South Africa, is the emergence in, in recent years, maybe in the last hundred years or so, of something which is called the prosperity gospel. Yeah. Um, tell, us, tell us a little bit about this. What is the prosperity gospel and, yeah. and how has this view infiltrated and in a sense misshapen um, yeah. the Christian values and the gospel of, of Christ? Yeah, we normally use the word prosperity gospel to refer to um, a gospel where redemption and material well-being are collapsed into one. So if I'm saved by Jesus Christ, it will also have an immediate or intermediate effect on my material well-being. And that material well-being, Dion, is normally translated either into physical health, but very often and mostly so into, into uh, you know, money wealth, uh, mater mm. material wealth. And, and um, what, is, what is so dangerous about the prosperity gospel it is it's not a total lie. It is what Karl Barth would call a half-truth. Mm. Now, the problem with a half-truth is it's actually more dangerous than a lie because a lie, mm. Dion, we can, if somebody says to me, Jesus Christ is not the Lord, you say, well, you can say that I, for me, that is an absolute standpoint of the church. Jesus Christ is the courier of the Lord. But if somebody says God wants to bless you when you are saved, uh, obviously God wants to bless you. Mm. So what happened here is that the, the, the link in scripture that is definitely there between the material blessings, for instance, of Abraham or the people of Israel under the king or the royal kingship of at least of David of, of when, when Israel was really a, a world power, or when they returned from exile, where, where others were condemned and they were blessed. That, that trend in scripture is indeed there. But the problem is that is not the full gospel. Mm. There's also the gospel of, 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 of where we suffer with Christ, mm. where our bodies, I mean, if you read the Psalms, my wife and I are busy uh, during my sabbatical reading the Psalms in the morning. And there's so many Psalms who say, my enemies look at me and say, where's your God? Look at mm. your body. You've got nothing. You are dying in your bed. Now, what makes the prosperity gospel so dangerous is, firstly, it, it takes a half-truth and makes it the whole truth. And secondly, it has absolutely no pastoral compassion with mm. people who suffer from illness or from material setbacks or so, because they normally say, ah, like the, they are like Job's friends, you know? Mm. Ah, uh, the reason why you are sick or got cancer is you've done something wrong somewhere. Mm. Uh, and we all know that that direct link between sin and, and consequences is in Scripture in some cases, but it's not the full story. And what is terrible to me, uh, especially as an, a fellow African, is to see how many um, innocent, sincere Africans are being misled by this. And I have to say this, perhaps not of all of them. They also are brothers. Most of them are men. Um, but the self-enrichment that goes on there is just amazing. Just to give you an example, Dion, uh, we've got family living in Portugal now. Uh, some of them uh, have some friends in Lisbon. They, their children go to a very posh private school. They're very, very rich. And so uh, the one guy said to him, you know, we've got an African there in the school. He's got three children and they all go to this post school so many euros every year and so forth I said oh well, that's wonderful where, where does he come from he's a pastor from africa hmm. he's built up a mega church uh, uh, uh made a lot of money uh, migrated to europe live in luxury uh, all based on what i would call a half truth which in fact is a terrible lie so um, hmm. i'm sorry i'm quite hard on this and i'm not condemning any of those persons i'm condemning the the doctrine it's mm. wrong 
doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you, you know, um, just uh, this last week, I have been thinking again, you know, it, it is, that is precisely what makes it so dangerous is that it takes a half truth and, and distorts it. And, uh, you know, my, my former bishop, Peter Story, always used to say the image of Christ that is presented is a mix between a personal therapist and a stockbroker. <laughs> so, you know, that's a, that's a, a very dangerous image to have. And of course, reasonably it's not sustainable the planet can't contain you know those levels of consumption it doesn't take account of the fact that aging and and some sicknesses are part of the the natural order of life yeah so so we do have to think quite critically i think about about some of those things we have to and you know what i think you know my my great uh, teacher at stellenbosch university where 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 you are now with the building behind you a very younger professor of dogmatics always said to us you know, um, I have to think now, I know it in Afrikaans better, but I'll say it in English. Uh, if, if, you see, if you see some practice in the church or somewhere that you condemn, you must know it is your unpaid account. Mm. And what he meant by that was normally uh, a half-truth springs up because the church has not spoken on that truth well enough and embedded it. And I remember, you know, I'm a reformed Dominion. And uh, God really led me in some of my services to call people to the front, to lay hands on them and pray for them. I, I, mm. I don't have the gift of healing. I do have the gift of prophecy and speaking, uh, pro proclaiming the gospel. I don't have the gift of of, 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 of uh, healing in, in the technical sense, although all of us can pray. And I uh, put oil on people in hospital to, to oil them, as the scripture tells us. So perhaps we've, we've done more of that. But at the same time, at funerals, explain, you know, that death is not the end. Mm. Uh, perhaps that, that unpaid account would not have come in the way that we see it now. So it's always a criticism of ourselves as well, if I may say our uh, people coming from the mainline churches. Yeah, and I think also, you know, Prof, absolutely, I agree with you. That's a beautiful way to think of it. And also, perhaps, you know, I often ask my students, when was the last time you heard your pastor preach about work, you know, because yes. it is, it's our members who, who should be helping us to build hospitals and better schools and provide for the future of our livelihoods. You know, what they do from a Monday to a, a Saturday is as important as what we do on a Sunday. I have a friend, John van der Laar, who always used to say, Monday is proof that Sunday is working. You can ah. always measure <laughs> whether your church is working well by yeah. how your members do their Monday work. Yeah, yeah. Now, by the way, I mean, just I just want to say, as a Christian, I headed up a business school. Now, I can't preach there like I would in a church. But what we did was, for instance, we changed the MBA curriculum and say, no one shall leave the school unless you spend... Uh, uh, two weeks in, a, in an NGO somewhere in a township or an informal settlement, assist them with a marketing plan and understand how some people try to eke out a living in a country with an unemployment rate officially of 32.7%. It just changes their mindset. You know, Absolutely. if you live from boardroom to boardroom and from first class airplane to five star hotel, the world is not real, man. You become mm. crazy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, let's touch on, on some of the main ethical issues that you think public theology and, and economics should touch on. And particularly, you know, what, what you see happening in relation to, to business, particularly global business and what they are doing yeah. and not doing. Well, I think, I think if, if you ask me which are the, the three or say four biggest issues uh, facing business now, uh, let me first mention them, is, is, is ecological crisis in which planet Earth finds itself. Uh, the second one is a growing, uh, relatively growing inequality, uh, mm -hmm. income inequality. Uh, thirdly is um, uh, unemployment. Uh, I talk about structural unemployment. That means people stop even looking for work. And lastly, uh, Dion, which is absolutely uh, important for us to, as theologians to quickly get our mind around is the, in, the impact of technology, robotics, artificial intelligence, and so forth uh, on our society. Now, we don't have time to speak on all of that, I, I suppose, but uh, uh, just, if I may, just quickly from, from uh, business understands this. 
the, the whole pressure on electric car uh, 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 manufacturing. I mean, I just saw here in Germany now that Porsche announced that by 2025, more than 80% of the vehicles will be electric. That's just, wow. you can say, well, they're still going to make money, but it is a response. Uh, and uh, a legislation coming now, no new houses may be built unless they conform to certain ecological standards. So I think business has awoken up to that, although we still have huge portions of business, specifically the fossil fuel industry, that I mean, for them, it's still a tough race. Ahead. But, but that's, that's one. The inequality one is extremely tough. I mean, we just got Piketty's book that just explained that it's not only huge uh, differences in, in wage income, but specifically capital income. And Dion, it's it, from a Christian perspective, unacceptable, but mm. also from a business perspective. We cannot build a world where amongst countries and inside countries, there are these massive concentrations of wealth where people feel excluded from that. And then the, uh, work, um, as you, I mean, you've written on this as well, Work is much more than earning a salary. It is part mm. of your social conditioning as a person. It shapes your identity. So unemployment is a very serious social issue. And what mm. we do now find, and that links to robotics and artificial intelligence, is that we get growth in the economy, GDP growth, but we don't get growth in in, in, in increased employment because mm. people are able in the mining industry, in the banking industry, and more and more even in the medical industry uh, to work with artificial intelligence and cut out, uh, you know, human input. So there's no um, shortage of big issues that we face. And I'm not talking, uh, you know, even about uh, corruption and care for the poor and all the other things. Yeah, and of course, I mean, this is exactly where if we believe in a God who has a will for the world, uh, we should be giving some input, but we should also be thinking and listening and researching and, and praying about these uh, things in our lives. That's a, a couple of very important issues. Let's, let's move towards um, closing our discussion. What, what are some of the trends that you think uh, we should uh, pay attention to in public theology and, and economics in the future? Yeah, I think our first task is to re-establish the positive link between economics and theology. Mm. It was there in the past. Uh, I recently read the theological interpretation of, of Adam Smith, which was absolutely amazing. Just explain that uh, Adam Smith is known as the father of so-called capitalism, but in a way he was, a, 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 he was a social thinker. He wanted to think about how his wealth uh, created and he was very clear on the justice side of that so let us not pull him out of out of perspective so i think our first and continuous talks and i must say i'm i'm really encouraged by it both from the side of economists and from the side of, of Christian theologians. that And may I include here our, our uh, colleagues from the um, uh, Muslim world, because there's a very strong financial dispensation under uh, 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 Sharia banking, which are mm. economically extremely virtuous to look at. So uh, mm. let us not forget them. We also have obviously uh, 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 big Jewish businesses that run on the basis of the, the, the tenets of the, of the Jewish religion. So it's, it's also a, a, a interreligious debate around the link between the two. The second thing that I see is, Dion, which is very tough on us as theologians, unless we can participate with economists in policy matters, mm. we will simply be talking to each other. Hmm. We have to be able to sit at the table where the policies are made. And the reason why we as theologians suffer with, struggle with policy is that we're not used to compromising. You know, hmm. we like to say God has a preferential option for the poor. The Old Testament is clear that the widows and the children will be looked after by the law. Uh, we read the Accra Confession and say, you know, globalization is a, a, a conspiracy by the rich against the poor. Now, all of that, I must say, I, I concur. I understand that. That is kind of prophetic language. But you're not going to change society only through prophecy. Mm. You have to work with economists on, OK, what does that mean for a progressive tax system? Mm. What does that mean for, for education? Mm. What does that mean for international trade? And, and we are not always present at that table. And this is where Germany, for instance, for me, okay, it's a different country. The Catholic and Lutheran churches here has very strong official status. 
But I mean, Angela Merkel uh, a few weeks ago uh, said here yeah, that uh, the government cannot take big decisions on Corona without the advice of the churches. Mm. So you around her at the table are the economists to explain what are the implications for business. You've got the uh, medical people, the immunologists, or what they call themselves. How does the academic work, uh, the epidemic work? And then you've mm. got the theologians and say, what does that mean for, uh, for, for our social fabric? So I think we need to develop uh, a strong enough standing in the eyes of economists and politicians so that they take us seriously enough so that we can be at the thing and that is where you have to that's a tough one where you must make compromises for this because we all know no policy can execute uh, any idea perfectly you have to make what what is best in your own hands and then just lastly um do you want, i don't know where this technology thing is going to take us but it is scary it is mm. extremely fast and just when you think you understand it, there's, there's, a, there's another development. So I think we as theologians have to think very clearly about things like God's omniscience, his providence. I don't know how we're going to link that to a society that, that will live uh, almost completely on a data-driven basis and what that means mm. for us. So we still have some work ahead, but I'm, I'm positive. Uh, I'm saying none of this to say it's not going to be possible. But we as theologians will have to work hard on dogmatics learning the language of economics and make sure we're there with the policy guys. Well, Prof, thanks so much for, for guiding us today and, and thanks for your expertise, uh, a lifetime of reading and thinking, of speaking with others, of acting uh, as that interlocutor. I loved what you said earlier, the one who translates between these two different worlds and, and helps economists to think about softer issues, justice and goodness and sustainability, but also helping the churches to think about issues like, you know, accountability and pragmatism and, and these kinds of things. So thanks for playing that role for us. And uh, everything of the best with your, your research uh, there in Germany. And we look forward to seeing you uh, back in, in South Africa in due course. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dion. And thank you, everyone watching. May the Lord bless this video. It's through his glory. <laughs>